Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off with a discussion of a pattern AMD have filed for a chiplet-based machine learning accelerator, MLA. It works very much with matrix multiplication, similar to NVIDIA's tensor cores, but with a key difference. This technology is essentially a chiplet and could be combined with a high-performance GPU, an APU, or whatever else to create a greater whole. Clearly, AMD are definitely on the chiplet train, as I'm sure you're aware by now, their CPUs have been chiplets for some time, and it's almost certain RDNA3 will carry this forward. We know from leaks that RDNA3 is targeting to have 160 compute units, which is apparently over two uh, processing dies, each of those dies obviously having 80 CU each. And according to my early information, AMD are targeting about a 2.5 times increase in performance over what we have with, let's say, the RX 6900 XT, and this is a combination of, well, more CU, higher clock frequencies, and obviously IPC gains, as well as more memory bandwidth and other tweaks in the architecture. But let's have a look at this patent, because I find it particularly interesting for several reasons. The patent's name is Chiplet Integrated Machine Learning Accelerator. I'll, of course, link the full patent in the video description. AMD are describing this pattern as an MLA, once again, Machine Learning Accelerator, which is essentially a chiplet design which can be combined with, let's say, a GPU. This will then create an APD, Accelerated Processing Device. Now, the MLA can also be manufactured on a different package to what the, what the actual GPU is manufactured on. So, for sake of argument, RDNA3 could be manufactured on 5nm, whereas the MLA, that could be created on 7nm, or it could just be manufactured by a different company. For example, Samsung could manufacture the uh, MLA, whereas AMD's uh, deal with uh, TSMC and, of course, the 5nm process would go ahead and they would be utilizing them for their GPU. In fact, there is a rather interesting side note to all of this. There is a rumor, I believe it was Harakazi who stated this on Twitter, but basically there's a rumor that AMD might be employing Samsung to produce some silicon for them in the future because of all these shortage problems. So maybe that could be one explanation for that, but this is certainly falling way outside the scope of what's stated here in the pattern. And of course, a patent is just a patent. A patent doesn't necessarily become a product or the implementation of the patent may be different to what we see here. Though just putting a little bit of thought into it, it's not difficult to imagine several scenarios how this could be of benefit to AMD. DLSS has been one of the major selling points for NVIDIA, especially I think for RTX 30. Yes, the RTX 3080 or even the 3090 are really powerful cards, but a game like Control is not going to be playable at 120 frames per second with hardware-based ray tracing enabled. Same thing for, let's say, Shadow of the Tomb Raider and so on and so on. So DLSS has been very important there, I think. And yeah, um, DLSS kind of started with not ideal image quality. I think that we all saw that there was a lot of softness to the image. A hair in particular had a lot of haloing. It just didn't look great. Let's just be totally blunt. But this started to improve pretty drastically, and now the latest implementation, DLSS 2, is really good. And yeah, I went into this more extensively in my Native Resolution is Dead video, which I'll link in the video description. Bottom line, though, is that all of this, of course, utilizes NVIDIA's tensor cores, which is something that, well, AMD are kind of mirroring here, but again, it's on a chiplet design. This also has tons of benefits in terms of the implementation. So, for sake of argument, you could use this design for a high-performance GPU. So, just an example, you could have two uh, RDNA3 chiplets for um, compute side of things, so 160 compute units, and then you would throw one of these MLAs on as well, and then obviously that would be for high-performance gaming. So you could get one of these MLAs as a chiplet and then, of course, throw it onto a high-performance GPU. For example, RDNA 3 allegedly has two uh, compute-based chiplets, so 160 uh, compute units total. So you could throw two of those on along with one of these MLAs, and that would create a high-performance GPU, which could obviously do upsampling or whatever else using what we can basically call uh, tensor-like operations. Another possibility is that you could put one of these onto an APU for those who want to do maybe scientific research or high performance gaming on a more kind of uh, mobile solution. But 
You could also pair several of these chiplets for a GPU designed for the data center. For example, for scientific research purposes, machine learning, whatever else. So basically, it comes down to the philosophy from AMD, which seems to have just been embedded into their culture, and that is design scalable products. Scalability seems to be the cornerstone of what AMD are creating products around at the moment. And yeah, we've seen that, of course, with RDNA 2. While RDNA 2 is not chiplet in nature, the design itself, for example, the Infinity Cache, just how the entire uh, compute units work, the architecture is extremely scalable. So you can create a design which is great for consoles or really great for high performance uh, desktop GPUs. And of course, this does seem to be carried forward with RDNA 3. And now we're gonna shift our focus onto the Xbox Series S, specifically comments from a developer who have created Rift Breaker, um, which is a title which is running on Xbox Series X and S. And they believe that Microsoft's commitment to creating the Xbox Series S may have been great for customers in terms of giving them a cheaper option. However, the specifications of the hardware have created hardships for developers. Let's get into it. Full credit, by the way, to WCCF Tech for this interview. So I'll, of course, link it in the video description. Yes, the Xbox Series S requires additional optimization. And this is according to the COO of XOR Studios, Powell Lecky. Hopefully I pronounced his name correctly. While we're able to simply compile Rift Breaker for the Xbox Series X, and it just works, apparently he's been taking lessons from Papa Jensen, the XSS requires additional optimization. Still, it doesn't look like it will require that much work when running well at 1080p on the XSS. The best thing about the current architecture is the CPU power on both Xbox consoles is practically the same. Scaling graphical effects is a lot easier than scaling gameplay. The amount of available memory is a determining factor in a lot of cases when we talk about the size of a game world or how many things can be happening within the same given time. The size of the memory that is available on the Xbox Series S is the actual determining point for the entire console generation of gameplay features have to be fitted to the lowest spec. From the point of view of a developer, it would be much easier if there was a single Xbox Series X SKU, but given the circumstances, I think that Microsoft have made a good choice in how to create a much cheaper console that can still run next generation games. He also added, and this is regards to ray tracing, yes, we plan to have ray tracing effects enabled on next generation consoles. However, we don't have final performance results of the console models. For example, we'll be trying to be aiming for ray tracing effects enabled on Xbox Series X, while the Xbox Series S may have to have them in a reduced capacity, end quote. So let's have a look at the Xbox Series S's specifications. Looking at the CPU, it's almost parity to the Xbox Series X, as the developer mentions, 3.6 gigahertz if you have SMT disabled, but 3.4 gigahertz if you're running with SMT enabled. Honestly, I think most games in the future will run with SMT enabled. We also have a 4T flop GPU, uh, and that's running with 20 compute units at 1.565 gigahertz, and of course it's custom RDNA 2. The memory is the main point of contention here. We have 10 gigabytes of GDDR6 memory with eight gigabytes being at 224 gigabytes per second and the other two gigabytes at just 56 gigabytes per second. And wisely, Microsoft have uh, kept the same amount of IO throughput. So that's 2.4 gigabytes per second raw and 4.8 gigabytes per second compressed. And this is with, of course, a custom hardware-based decompression block. Because the resolution targets of the Xbox Series X and the PlayStation 5 are way higher than what is being targeted for the Xbox Series S, which is 1080p or 1440p, this means that the Series S can typically get away with lower resolution textures and other assets, which should save quite a lot of RAM. According to Microsoft, the 10GB total RAM, or 8GB available to developers, should be sufficient. I don't know it's becoming a meme at this point, but yes, Microsoft are improving the SDK and the tools for the Xbox systems. Of course, this is not happening in isolation, and Sony are doing much the same thing for the PlayStation 5. With the Xbox's SDKs, developers can better understand what assets are being loaded into memory, how they can optimize and improve performance, and naturally, this is profiles for both the Xbox Series X as well as the Xbox Series S. 
a couple of points before we go forward. First of all, the uh, compressed data read speeds are actually worst case scenarios. In fact, it was said by Microsoft a couple of times, now I covered this more extensively, that in real world scenarios, it's probably much higher than that. In fact, I believe it's the same for the PlayStation 5, um, but you can probably get much higher than that. However, they wanted to be more conservative with their figures, hence 4.8 gigabytes per second. The second uh, point is that Microsoft, of course, have two sets of memory for the Xbox Series X as well as S. So this slower RAM pool, which is just two gigabytes, is used primarily for the OS reserves. So the game resides in the eight gigabyte portion, which means you've only got eight gigabytes of uh, RAM at least available at one time for games developers, which means you've only got eight gigabytes of RAM available for games developers. However, the idea, of course, of the next generation consoles is you can pull data really quickly from the SSD as you require it. This is something that Mark Cerny did describe during the Road to PlayStation 5 event. Basically, just because of the read speeds of the SSDs of the next generation systems, you don't need to worry about the slow, to be honest with you, not exactly responsive uh, mechanical drives of the previous generation, which took absolutely ages to stream data into the uh, memory. This means that you can just have the uh, next couple of seconds of gameplay, and then you can obviously stream in new data as you require it. I went into this much more extensively into my SSD video for the next generation consoles. I'll try to remember to link it in the video description. But ultimately, it will also depend on the developer and the type of game of how much RAM they feel is needed. And well, yeah, different developers, different game engines and different styles of game will scale differently on different hardware. I.e., just like some games will run better on the PlayStation 5 or some games will run better on the Xbox Series X in terms of their performance targets, simply based upon how that game is uh, constructed, what uh, type of effects are being used in the game, what resolution targets, what you know, graphical effects are being used, and tons of other uh, you know, criteria. The Xbox Series S and its memory uh, deficit, if you want to call it that, is going to impact certain games more than others. From the perspective of a gamer, I don't think that I'm personally interested in the Xbox Series S, but I know tons of people who have purchased one because they're not maybe such hardcore gamers, maybe they don't have the budget for it, or yeah, it's just a secondary system in the home and they're happy to just use the Xbox Game Pass or pick up the odd game as necessary and they don't have like a high refresh rate 4K television anyway to take advantage of it. So in those respects, I do understand the appeal from the gamer's perspective. Developers though, I suspect that they're going to be a lot less uh, happy about this. Obviously it's more work in terms of the optimization side of things as you've got more hardware. But this is of course similar to what we saw with the Xbox One, Xbox One X, PlayStation 4, PlayStation 4 Pro, and Let's just be really honest, if the PlayStation 4 Pro had just taken over completely over the PlayStation 4 and you no longer had to target PS4 base, for example, then it would have been a lot easier for developers. I think it's way too early at the moment in the console generation to know how this is going to impact the consoles in the long term. It's so early that no one really fully understands how to make full use of the hardware. And for Sony, obviously, this doesn't impact them at all when it comes to their first-party games. For Microsoft and their first-party studios, so for example, 343, well, yeah, they have the resources as well as, of course, the drive to really optimize for their hardware. It's really the third-party studios that this is going to be a problem for. And as I mentioned a moment ago, I think it's going to be down to A, the type of game that you're creating, the game engine, as well as, of course, the skill, as well as the resources of the developer. Yeah, um, it, could, it could be that in some cases it does hold back the generation, or it could just be that the Series S version of the game is what is not ideal. Maybe there are some concessions for the Series S version, whereas the PlayStation 5 and the uh, Xbox Series S, uh, sorry, X versions, those are all shiny and amazing. Some titles, of course, they're not really held back at all other than the graphical side of things. Like we've seen, for example, uh, Control, the uh, you know remastered edition for the next generation consoles, that's targeting 1440p, 60 FPS with ray tracing disabled for the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X, but 30 FPS if you have ray tracing enabled on the Series X as well as the PlayStation 5. 
and obviously major cuts for the Xbox Series S simply because of the GPU performance. So it doesn't really seem to be the memory there. So again, it's going to be really down to the game engine and the developer and a lot of other things. It's going to be really interesting to see how this generation unfolds, especially now that we're starting to finally hear more about the Super Switch or Switch Pro 2. Um, of course, I first broke the story last year that Nintendo were working on a 4K capable Switch system. And from what we understand at this point, it is going to be 4K capable, but it is going to be much like the Pro consoles we've seen from Sony as well as Microsoft. So you will still need, of course, to be able to create a game which is going to run on the older hardware. So it's, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be very interesting from the perspective of a Switch, given that certain ports, therefore, from the PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series X or whatever, I would just be very curious to see how you would able to port those to the base Switch hardware. I think that's just about it for this particular video. Hopefully you have enjoyed it. If you have, of course, subscribe to the channel and also ring the bell icon because it's the land of YouTube. And with that said, take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day and bye for now.